E siamo arrivati alla presentazione di Monsignor Thomas Halik. Quando pensavo a come presentare il relatore, mi sono accorto che se si cercasse di dire tutto prenderebbe un bel po' di tempo. Così mi accontento di una presentazione breve, ma spero essenziale. Monsignor Thomas Halik è sacerdote della Diocesi di Praga nella Repubblica Ceca e professore di sociologia nell'Università Carolina in quella città dove è anche rettore della Chiesa del Santissimo Salvatore per la pastorale con studenti universitari e anche altri, e è presidente dell'Accademia Cristiana Ceca. Ci sono alcuni, anche se non faccio la presentazione esaustiva, ci sono alcune cose che meritano di essere notate. I campi di studio di Monsignor Halik includono la sociologia, la filosofia, la psicologia, oltre alla teologia. E quando gli studenti e ex alunni dell'Istituto di Psicologia sentono un elenco così, riconoscono la musica. È un curriculum che ben risuona con le aspirazioni dell'Istituto di Psicologia. Possiamo aspettare alcune stimolanti riflessioni, allora, su un tema che ci sta a cuore. Il titolo della presentazione, che sarà in inglese, è Spiritual Accompaniment, a Task for Pastoral Psychology and Theological Anthropology. Allora, vi lascio a Monsignor Halik. Grazie. Your Eminency, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, Cives Academici, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Christianity in late modernity has found itself in a kind of cultural homelessness, uh, which is one of the causes of its present crisis. In this time of changing civilizational paradigmas, the Christian faith is only now finding a new shape, a new home, new means of expression new social and cultural roles, and new allies. Will it become embodied in one of the existing or newly emerging forms of religion, or will it become, as some theologians have declared, a non-religious faith? Perhaps the very dynamism and diversity of postmodernity that frightens many Christians is the incubation pace of the Christianity of the future. In today's post-secular era, two forms of religion in particular are offered as the fruit and consequence of the transformation of religion in the process of secularization. Religion as a defense of group identity and religion as a spirituality, separated from church and tradition. While the first of these forms is primarily intended to strengthen group cohesion, and it's close to political ideology, the second offers a certain integration of the personality, and it's closer to the role of psychotherapy. The main challenge for ecclesiastical Christianity today is the return from religion to spirituality, while the traditional institutional forms of religion, 
often resemble the rying cry of birds. Interest in spirituality of all kinds is a surging current undermining old banks and carving out new channels. Even the Second Vatican Council would seem to have been more about preparing the Church to align itself with the secular humanism and atheism, and it seems not to have envisaged a great expansion of interest in spirituality. The mainstream churches were not prepared for the hunger for spirituality and are often still unable to respond adequately to it. I am deeply convinced that the future of the churches depends largely on whether, when and to what extent they understand the importance of this shift and how they can respond to this sign of the times. Evangelization, the center task of the church, will never be sufficiently new and effective unless, unless it penetrates the deep dimension of human life and human culture, which is the habitat of spirituality. If evangelization consists in sowing the seed of the gospel message in good soil, then this soil must be something deeper than the rational and emotional component of human personality. It has to be the innermost region, which Augustine called memoria, Pascal called the heart, and Carl Gustav Jung called das Selbst. Evangelization without existential transformation Metanoia is just an indoctrination. The task awaiting Christianity consists largely in the development of spirituality, and a newly conceived Christian spirituality can make a significant contribution to the spiritual culture of humanity today, even far outside the bounds of the churches. Spirituality is the lifestyle of faith. It is the sap of the tree of faith. It nourishes and animates both dimension of faith, both the spiritual life, the inner religious experience, in the way in which faith is lived and reflected upon, and outward practice of faith manifested in the action of believers in society, in communal celebration, in the embodiment of faith in culture. I consider this dimension of faith to be crucial, especially in the time ahead. Christianity as religio, embodied in the culture and political form of Christianitas, Christian civilization, is definitely a thing of the past and its nostalgic imitation results only in traditionalist caricatures. Secularization then created a second, modern type of religion, Christianity as a worldview, as a denomination. But the modern age, modernity, is over. And the type of Christianity that identified itself with religion in the modern sense of the word is also on its way out. Neither the medieval nor the modern form of religion can be the permanent social and cultural home of the Christian faith. The pathfinder of the transformation facing Christianity in our day have been prophetic figures in the ranks of Christians, such as Pascal with his critic of the religion of the philosophers, Kierkegaard with his critic of bourgeoisie Christianity, and Teilhard de Chardin and Carl Gustav Jung with their critic of Christianity that has lost its generative power. 
For centuries, ecclesiastical authorities have sought to control the spontaneity and vitality of spiritual life, to guard the orthodoxy of the creeds, to control the former expression of belief, and to discipline the morals of the faithful. Spirituality as a dynamic inner dimension and form of faith more easily evaded that control. This is also why, throughout history, the ecclesiastical authorities have often threat this form of faith with caution and suspicion. The ecclesiastic, uh, ecclesiastical authorities try to discipline and institutionalize non-conformist spiritual movements, such as that of Francis of Assisi and his followers, as much as possible. Many of the pioneers of the new spiritual currents, who were later declared saints by the Church, such as Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and initially Ignatius of Loyola, also confronted mistrust, harassment, and suppression in the Church. But, as psychoanalysis teaches us, and as many examples from history have demonstrated, everything that is suppressed and displaced always returns in some altered, altered form. Often in the times of crisis in institutional religion, there has been a great revival of spirituality in lay Christian circles. For example, when the form of the church was in deep crisis in the high Middle Ages and various tensions were growing within the church as well as conflicts between the church and the secular authorities, the hierarchy made excessive use of the interdict, a kind of general strike of the church apparatus, as a punishment. When the operation of the church, including the celebration of the sacraments, came to halt, lay Christians were forced to look for alternative paths, and one form was the revival of personal spirituality. This contributed, among other things, to the individualization of faith that then developed into the Protestant Reformation and secular spirituality. In times of crisis, in the strictly hierarchical medieval church, lay brotherhoods grew and they disseminated a quite pietistic spirituality as well as, at other times, revolutionary heliastic spirituality of passionate anti clerical resistance. One example was the Hussite movement in Bohemia. The revival of interest in spirituality at the end of the second millennium of Christianity may also be related to some extent to the culmination crisis of power, authority, and influence of traditional religious institutions and their credibility. Precisely because spirituality, out of the entire broad spectrum of religious phenomena, is the least con labor by ecclesiastical authority, it is the era that is most easily emancipated from the ecclesiastical form of religion. Today, the relation of spirituality to religion is the subject of much debate. If art and many other cultural phenomena have gradually freed themselves from the embrace of religion, why shouldn't spirituality follow suit and establish itself as a separate domain governed by its own rules? If the Church in the documents of Second Vatican Council recognizes the legitimate autonomy of science, art, economics, and politics, and renounces its aspiration to dominate these sectors of life, should it not similarly recognize the emancipation of spirituality from religion in its ecclesiastical form? But what would remain of the church and religion 
or a religious life without spirituality. Faith without works is dead, says the Apostle. But faith without spirituality is also dead. Spirituality, a living faith, preceded intellectual reflection, the doctrinal aspect, an institutional expression of faith is transcendent them and sometimes revives and transforms them in the moments of crisis. At the turn of the third millennium, in the epoch sometimes referred to uh, as a new exile age, various circumstances contributed to the vitality and attractiveness of spirituality, not only in lay Christian circles, but also beyond the confines of the churches. The process of globalization, the interpenetration of worlds, has also contributed to the revival and enrichment of spirituality in the West. The postmodern turn to spirituality has thrown much inspiration from oriental spirituality. This trend was also viewed, and in many places still is viewed with a great suspicion by many church authorities and conservative Christians, and sometimes they even demonize it. Since the 1960s, interest in spirituality, especially Far Eastern spirituality, such as yoga and Zen and other schools of meditation, have found fertile soil in circles of humanistic and transpersonal psychology and psychotherapy, as well as in personal development courses and in nonconformist culture, such as beatnik movement. The colorful wave of this subculture, whose promised land was mainly California, was subsequently termed the New Age Movement. It was certainly understable and legitimate for church authorities to take a critical stance toward the syncretism of this movement. To their detriment, however, they failed to ask what needs and signs of the times these movements were responding to, and whether the church was capable of responding more competently. In the Christian milieu, only since the first wave of Christian yoga and Christian Zen, has there been a renewed interest in the study of the classics of Christian mysticism and many centers are springing up and putting Christian meditation into practice. Some centers of Christian spirituality are ecumenical in character and renounce any proselytism. The ecumenical These community in France, for example, has inspired a worldwide Christian youth movement that reaches out to many seekers. The spiritual accompaniment of seekers is clearly a form of ministry that a church can offer not only to its faithful, but also to the growing world of the nuns, people they don't identify themselves with organized religion, but Many of them call themselves spiritual, spiritual, but non-religious. I believe that the vanguard of this ministry of the church, the ministry of spiritual accompaniment, is so-called categorical pastoral care, the ministry of chaplains in hospitals, in the prisons, in the army, and in education. It can also take form of spiritual accompaniment of people in all kinds of difficult life situation or supporting those who are engaged in a similarly demanding ministry to others and are at risk of burn out. The chaplain's ministry 
is intended for everyone, not just for the faithful. Uh, the priests in prisons are not just uh, for the pious criminals, but for everybody. He differs both from the traditional pastoral ministry of clergy, such as parish priests, who visit their parishioners in hospitals and administer the sacraments, and from mission in the sense of converting non-believers and winning new members for the church. It is also different from the work of psychologists and social workers. It is a spiritual ministry, a spiritual accompaniment. Spiritual ministry is based on the assumption that the spiritual realm is an anthropological constant that is intrinsic to human beings and helps to shape their humanity. The spiritual is concerned with meaning, both the meaning of life and the meaning of a particular life situation. People need not only to know in theory, but also to actually uh, live and experience the fact that their life, with all its joys and pains, has meaning. The need for meaning and awareness of meaningfulness are among people's basic existential needs. However, in demanding life situation, the awareness of meaningfulness tends to be shattered and needs to be resurrected. The worst of the threaten us in moments of life's trials and crises when we experience fear and abandonment in times of pain, deep sadness, danger, and suffering of all kinds, is what Kierkegaard called thickness unto death, despair, loss of hope, loss of meaning in life. We need awareness of the meaning of life as much as we need air, food, and drink. We cannot live permanently in inner darkness and disorientation. Since time immemorial, people have demanded that religion and philosophy help them cope with contingency, with train wrecks, to help them process and integrate new disruptive events. The need to be given a name and a place in people's image of the world and a understanding of life. The ministry of spiritual accompaniment straddles the boundary between religious and secular spheres. It may draw on the spiritual treasures of religion, but it lives in non-ecclesiastical secular space and must express itself in a way that is understable to that environment. From that point of view, this specific ministry has a similar status and task to that of public theology. It must transcend the boundaries of the church's language game. After special training, which includes some competence in psychotherapy, the church, uh, churches dispatch their clergy and lay theologians in the ministry, also to people who do not identify with churches or with believers. Their job is to listen to them and to talk to them, to foster their trust and hope in their own search for meaning. It is not their task to convert these people to their faith or bring them into the membership of their churches. Accompanied must have a highly developed capacity for empathy and respect for their clients' values. There are times when even the non-believer asks for prayer and when it's appropriate to use the therapeutic power of religious language, symbols and rituals, including the sacraments, when ministering to people who are not fully settled in the spiritual space of traditional religion. At other times, however, the person accompanying has to forget all such elements. 
chaplains in hospital wards, prison cells, military camps, or university clubs cannot use many of the typical traditional expression of faith not only for reasons of political correctness, but primarily because most of their clients would not understand this language. In a dialogue of partnership with those who believe differently, traditional concepts and symbols of faith must be used very sparingly. In these situations, chaplains rarely speak explicit, explicitly about God and Jesus Christ with those who do not belong to their denomination. They find themselves in the realm of a different language game. This does not mean that God is not present, however. Unlike traditional missionary work or traditional therapy, this ministry of closeness has a dialogical, reciprocal character. As Christians, we do not have considered those who do not follow in our company, merely as a target for missionary conversion or potential opponents or enemies. Jesus commanded us to love all people, to become neighbors. One of the faces of love is respect for other Others' otherness. Love is the space of freedom that we open up to others so that they can be truly and fully themselves without any affectation and without having to constantly earn our favor. Love is a space of trust, of security, of acceptance, a space enabling our clients to develop what is most precious in themselves, to become themselves. It is only when we have experience being accepted and loved, just as we are, that we learn to accept and love others. This royal road to spiritual accompaniment it's Alpha and Omega is the cultivation of a contemplative attitude towards the world and one's own life. Spiritual accompaniment can be of assistance to nobody unless it teaches the practice of inner attunement, the art of detaching oneself from life on the surface and going deeper of achieving free dispassion and detachment or perceiving and experiencing one's life from a broader perspective. The mission of the spiritual companion is to say to clients what Jesus said when he first addressed his future disciples, launch out into the deep and wait in silence. But they must also be taught how to do it, to be initiated into the art of contemplation, for only in this way can they find contact with meaning and restore balance and direction in their lives in liminal and crisis situation. In order to develop a beneficial ministry for their clients and a wider community, accompaniers need to be contemplative. It seems people who meditate regularly, their task is to teach the art of spiritual discernment, without which people today are utterly at a sea in the noisy and overcrowded global marketplace. Spiritual accompaniers do not have to be spiritual, geistliche, in the sense of ordained minister of the church, but they must be spiritual people, people who do not just live on the surface of life, but drawn from their inner depths. The spiritual accompaniment is not classical mission of recruiting new church members. It is not very realistic to expect most nuns to find a permanent home within the current 
mental and institutional borders of the church. However, centers of open Christianity, especially those devoted to courses in meditation, can expand these borders. Most valuable service to the credibility and vitality of the faith will probably be rendered by those Christians who have the courage to go behind the present mental and institutional boundaries of the traditional churches and following the example of St. Paul, succeeded in being all things to all people and venture out as seekers with seekers onto new paths. The church needs to create spiritual centers, places not only of adoration and contemplation, but also of encounter of and conversation uh, where experiences of faith can be shared. Many Christians are concerned that in a number of countries, the network of parishes, which was created several centuries ago, in a completely different social, cultural, and pastoral context, and with the framework of a different theological self-understanding of the church, is being increasingly torn apart. It is not realistic to expect that this process will stop, such as by importing priests from abroad. Even if the Roman Catholic Church ventures to ordain married men as priests, very probati, give the laity even more scope, and especially to use the charism of women into liturgy and preaching and in leadership of the church communities, steps that will probably happen soon or later, it is not realistic to expect that this will enable the network of territorial pastoral care to be restored to the form it assumes in pre-modern society. The leadership of the church ought now to be already considering not only an alternative pastoral ministry in a changing world, but also to reform along the same lines the education and training of those whom it elects and equips for ministry in the church. I am convinced that the major focal points of Christianity in future will not be territorial parishes, but rather centers of spirituality and spiritual accompaniment, like in the um, early uh, Middle Age, uh, the Benedictine monasteries, they have the uh, radiation. It is the church, if the church wants to go beyond its boundaries, and Pope Francis is called for this, and serve all, then this ministry must be linked to respect for the otherness and freedom of those it addresses. It must be free from the intention to squeeze everyone into the ranks and gain control over them, to colonize them. It must trust in the power of God, taking seriously that the fact, uh, the fact, that the spirit is at work beyond the visible boundaries of the church. Until now, the church has focused primarily on the pastoral care for its faithful and a mission aims at expanding the ranks. Another era since the beginning of Christianity has been diaconia, charity. It is primarily in this field that Christians learn to serve all people in pain and need thus fulfilling the Jesus' call to universal love and to mercy without boundaries and uh, proselyzing intentions. Here Christians have borne and continue to bear witnesses through deeds without words, through the solidarity of love and demonstrating close involvement. In the spirit of Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan, they do not ask, who is my neighbor, and who is no longer my neighbor, as he was asked by Pharisee, who wanted to ju justify himself, who wanted to justify the narrow limits of his willingness to love and help. They know 
They, they must make themselves neighbors, be close to others, especially those in need. This therapeutic closeness and solidarity have taken and continues to take many forms and it also has a political dimension. Pope Francis compares church to a field hospital. Such should not remain behind the walls of its certainties in splendid isolation from the outside world but rather go courageously to places where people are physically, socially, psychologically and spiritually wounded, trying to dress and heal the wounds. The church as a hospital must also care for the health of society, for the prevention and diagnosis of diseases that attack entire societies as well as for subsequent therapy and rehabilitation. It must strive to surmount social things and deviant structures within social systems. For decades, the social teaching of the church has pointed out that sin is not just a matter of individuals. We are increasingly entrenched in, the, in a massive web of economic and political relations where evil often assumes a suprapersonal and anonymous voice. One of the many reasons why confessionals and confessional rooms have emptied is that a consciousness of personal responsibility has blurred against the background of what we know about the many biological, psychological, and social factors that strongly influence our actions. We can always hide in a thick set of excuses and justifications. How can a person be guilty at all? We are all human beings here, one like another, said Joseph K. in Kafka's The Trial Process. But the conformity and superficiality of life are also blameworthy, more perhaps than much of what people whisper in the gloom of confessionals. A considerable number of Christians suspect that what separates them from God are far deeper and subtler realities than those enumerated by the traditional confessional mirrors, the list of sins on which uh, those mortal sins are marked with an asterisk. People don't recognize themselves in the confessional mirrors. During my 43 years of priestly ministry, I have had tens of thousands of confessions. For many years, in addition to the sacrament of penance, I have offered spiritual talks that are longer and more in-depth than the ordinary form of the sacrament allows, and they relate to the broader context of spiritual life. These converse conversations are sometimes attended by the unbaptized and by many who would or could be described as non-religious, but nonetheless spiritually grounded or seeking. I have expanded my team of co-workers for this ministry to include lay people educated in theology and psychotherapy. It is my firm conviction that the ministry of personal spiritual accompaniment will be the crucial pastoral role of the church in the forest coming uh, period of Christian history and the one most needed. At the same time, it is the ministry in which I have learned the most, in which my theology and spirituality, as well my understanding of faith and church, have undergone a certain transformation. When my bishop, the uh, former Archbishop of Prague, resolutely refused 
to speak with the victims of sexual abuse by priests, including a member of the monastery of which he was superior at that time, and referred them to, to, to the police, I engaged in lengthy late night conversations with many of them, after which I often spent a sleepless night. I did learn much more that what has I, I didn't learn much more that was already been published, but I looked these people in the eye and held their hands when they cried. And it was a very different experience from reading the reports of statement made to the police or in court. I worked for years as a psychotherapist, and I know how close and interwind mental and spiritual pains are, but this was something other than mere psychotherapy. I felt the presence of Christ there, with all my heart, on both sides, in the least of, the, of these, the thick, the imprisoned, and the persecuted, and also in the ministry of listening, consolation, and reconciliation that I was permitted to provide. I often read that to a short story. There's a kind of mini-gospel in the middle of uh, Matthew's Gospel, the story of a woman who had suffered from hemorrhage for 12 years after trying many doctors and spending her entire fortune on treatment to no avail. This woman was obviously hard in the very sanctum of her womanhood. She was bearing within her some severe trauma in an intimate region in her sexuality. According to Jewish law, a bleeding woman is ritually unclean and is not allowed to take part in religious ritual services. And it is no, no one is allowed to touch her, her compulsive desire for human contact led her to something that violated the prescribed isolation. She touched Jesus. She touched him steelily, anonymously, from behind, hidden in the crowd. But Jesus don't want her to take her healing that way. He seeks her face in a way he calls her by name, as he called the astonished Zacchaeus. He calls her, he cancels her anonymity. The woman comes forward. And after years of isolation, she tells the whole truth in the front of everyone. And in that moment of truth, she is freed from her melody. But her very touch, that foolhardly gesture of longing and trust, was the manifestation of her faith, the faith just that Jesus said healed her. It was an act by which she transgressed the law, for by her touch she made Jesus ritually unclean, a sin according to strict interpretation of the law. And yet, Jesus understands what she expressed by this touch. And by his interpretation, he lends the action of redemptive meaning. She completed what she had expressed in her body language, which had hid her toe manifested itself in blood and pain by prostrating, prostrating herself before him and telling the whole truth. This is what I experience in conversations with victims of sexual and psychological abuse in the church. 
their repressed pain, their disillusionment with the church, and their often unacknowledged groups against God, which often turn into self-blame or psychosomatic difficulties, needed to be expressed. It requires the safe space of unconditional acceptance. That is where the truth is revealed, and it is a very different understanding of the truth from that of the possessor of the truth. I dream of a church that would create such a safe space, a space of truth that heals and liberates. Thank you.